So uh, thank you very much for coming to this talk. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking about energy. And so just to set up the stage, thank you very much. So just to set up the stage uh, for, uh, for this talk, we have uh, the, the first slide shows a light bulb. And uh, in the last 24 hours, all of you might have turned on a light bulb, turned off a light bulb, or at least have been under a light bulb. All right? Now, given that, and there are so much light here, but how many of us think, where does this energy come from? Probably nobody, of, none of us would think, uh, what process actually gets us this energy? And so uh, the, the, the theme of this talk is to, uh, bring light to bring light to the point that how energy comes about, how do you actually get that energy, what does it mean to you, and how could you play a role in making this energy system better and more reliable as we go by? And that's the whole essence of the talk. As a professor, I probably have to tell you what the talk is about, so I just did that. So, <laughs> so uh, that's the course outline kind of a deal. So, <laughs> so we have that done, and so uh, I'm going to be talking about energy. So the next slide is supposed to show the electricity system. So somehow it will show up magically. I hope it will do. So the idea in, in there is to talk about the different kinds of energy sources that, should, uh, that, that are there in the province that enable energy generation, transmission, and distribution to all of us. So when you actually flick that, light, light, that switch on and, uh, and burn that light that you are so used, you're so used to, uh, there, is a, there is a fleet of generation that's available in the province. And it is a similar system likewise across the globe across every country, across every province, every state that you have. So everybody, every, every province has a mix of generation. So there is nuclear generation, there is uh, wind, there is solar, there is coal, there is um, natural gas, there is hydroelectric. These are the different kinds of generations that are available for us. In the province of Ontario, uh, capacity is about 36% or 38% of nuclear. Uh, over a year, we consume 50% of energy from nuclear power plants in Ontario. So when you flick that switch on, you should probably realize that 50% of the energy used to burn that light is coming from a nuclear power plant in the province. 2% of the energy comes from renewable energy sources. 25% comes from hydroelectric. So this is what you should probably realize when you flick that switch on. And Therein lies the challenge, and I'll come to the challenge as we go by. Um, now, when all of those generators are generating, they are generating at different locations in the province. And this is a similar system worldwide. It's a lot of energy that, that we consume at a, at a given point in time. And um, to transport that energy, just like you have roadways which transport traffic, you have huge transmission lines which transport energy from different locations to city centers like Toronto. So there are transmission companies which transmit energy over long distances. And you probably would be familiar with the, with the company Hydro One. So Hydro One is the provincial transmission company which transmits energy or transports energy from different places across the province, like Pickering Plant or a plants in Sarnia or Windsor or where have you, and those, that energy comes to sit different city centers. Once it comes to a city center, there is a distribution company that takes over. A good example is Toronto Hydro. It takes up that energy and distributes to different businesses and different residences. So this is the scheme of things. You have generation company which generates energy, transmission company which transports energy, and distribution companies which distribute energy. Then we have a central organization which is called the Independent Electricity System Operator. Uh, what that uh, IESO does is it predicts when you will consume energy and then schedule generation of the, uh, that energy to be delivered to you. So probably, IESO would know when you'll get up, when you're going to brush your teeth. I'm not going to go into the details, but <laughs> when you're going to consume more energy and accordingly prepare all those generators, schedule them in essence a day ahead so that it is up and ready and able to deliver energy to you right when you need it. So this is a business. The electricity business is an instantaneous business. 
It's not like the connecting flights that you have, that the next flight is three hours later. It's not like when you flick the switch on, the light will come, up, come on after three hours. It comes on right then. And to do all of that, there is a huge industry behind that light bulb. And probably there are millions of people who work in the province and across the globe who work to make that electricity industry function flawlessly, reliably, and every time that you want it to work. And that's the, that's the feature of energy supply system. I hope uh, I'm making sense here. So that's the most important characteristic of an energy supply system. It is able to deliver energy at the time, reliably, at a least cost, when you want it. And so that's a very important, important aspect of our society. And just so you know, if you have a society without a reliable energy supply, the, the society cannot do as good as we wish. The progress of a society depends upon reliable supply of energy. That's a key aspect that must be ingrained in all of our minds, right? So if we are looking to progress, we should have a very reliable electricity energy supply system. There are several societies across the globe, and probably I won't go and name the societies. In all of those societies, getting energy has become a challenge, and their progress is impeded just because they don't get energy when they want to go to work. And we don't have that problem here. So let's just get on to the next slide. Now, uh, there is a recent KPMG report. Uh, KPMG is a consulting company, and uh, KPMG uh, had done a report, and in that it identifies two big challenges for us, mankind. The two big challenges are urbanization and um, pollution or climate change. Urbanization, so this uh, slide here, or the picture, uh, shows you uh, condominium towers in the city of Hong Kong. There are so many windows in this building. So uh, last year I traveled to Hong Kong, and I went to visit my cousin. He was living in the 200th floor, looking over, yes. Yeah, I'm just exaggerating there. Probably he was in the 100th floor. <laughs> <laughs> but somewhere along the line, and you can get the message. It's a very dense city. Toronto is also getting to be a very dense city. And I had a good friend in Toronto Hydro who said that, literally, you're taking villages and putting them into city blocks. That's really what urbanization means. So you should probably travel to cities like Shanghai. The city of Shanghai in China consumes as much energy as our province does. And that's what urbanization is. And therein lies the challenge. And all of you must have gone on Don Valley Parkway, right? And coming down on Don Valley Parkway at 9 in the morning on a working day is a nice task, but a difficult task because it's congested. And that's really what is the same problem that comes to an electricity system because when all of us come downtown and all of us want to live downtown, those wires get congested. And it is difficult to get more wires downtown. And so by urbanization, we all are looking for a better life, but at the same time, we are stressing the system very, very badly. And so that is a big challenge that we have to overcome. So that's the urbanization challenge, and the challenge is posing a lot of, uh, lot of difficulty on the energy system. It is imposing a difficult task on the energy system. The other challenge, as I mentioned from the KPMG report, is, uh, is uh, climate change. And one of the contributors to climate change is fossil fuel-based generation plants. So oftentimes we burn probably coal, we burn uh, natural gas, and all of that causes climate change. How do we get past climate change? Or rather, the question should be framed as, how do I source energy without causing climate change? What can I do? And so the province is busy doing it, Everybody else across the globe is also busy doing it. In fact, they predict in the in, in, in United States, they'll get 50% of their energy from sun uh, through a variety of different technologies. So that's really where everybody is going. So that's a change that we uh, anticipate that will happen over the next half a century. It's an important change. But at that, there is a problem too. And the problem lies with us. Probably I should point the finger the other way because you're more on the other side. <laughs> so uh, the problem lies with us. And the reason is this. We expect, and this is going back to the light bulb. 
we expect that every time we flick that switch, a light will glow. Uh, but you take a wind generator, it likes to work in the night because in the night, temperature is low, air is dense, and there is more wind energy. Uh, sun energy is there in the daytime. I wish it was there in the nighttime, but it doesn't exist. That's why we have nights, those beautiful nights. So there is sun energy in the daytime, there is wind energy in the nighttime, but they all don't occur at the time when we want to flick that switch on. And so we have to either change or we have to change those systems so that we get energy at the right time. So there is a lot of research that goes on, and in the, in the, in the picture that you see, you have downtown Toronto with all those lights, and then you have sun energy. That's possibly the best kind of energy you can deploy in the city. And then you see a big box down there. The big box is, you all have cell phones, and they have batteries in them. If I take those batteries and stick it into that big box, it's a 40-foot trailer, so you know. It's in an experiment that we do at Ryerson. And it has lots of batteries. It has batteries so that you can power an entire block for a, probably a day. And so one of the things that we can do via research, and there is a lot of research that's going on on renewable energy, and a lot of research that's going on on battery technologies and energy storage. Why? So that I can take energy from sun when it comes, store it in those batteries whenever I have that energy, and then when you flick the switch on, I can make that light glow. So in the past, it was generation, transmission, and you guys consuming energy. Today is generation, transmission, storage, and consumption of energy. So the entire energy delivery paradigm is changing, and we could be a big piece of it. How? By researching, by buying energy, by, uh, by trying to find out new solutions. And so that's really where I'm hoping that all of you would also become a portion of that solution. That's really the pitch that I'm trying to make here, that it's not just the energy companies who have all the solutions. All of us together can decide and develop new technologies in terms of renewable energy, in terms of storage technologies, and make this energy system a little better so that we can supply energy reliably without pollution to urban centers. So this is the last picture that I have. And probably, you know what? You can find your face right there. <laughs> and all of you can together get to decide. Now, this is the other thing that you should probably note. The other thing that you should probably note in this, uh, in this uh, slide there is that many of these solutions require all of us. And I'll tell you where we can all fit in. If you have a battery technology, it requires chemists, it requires physicists, it requires engineers, it requires uh, economists, uh, business folks. You know, it's a diverse community that would go in to make all of those solutions viable, technically, uh, commercially viable, and then also people should adapt to those technologies. And that, that's where you'll have psychologists come in who will say, well, do you really want to adopt that technology? Now, there is a little story, and I have still two more minutes. I'm going to talk about the story. So many of those provinces uh, or states roll out demand response programs and conservation programs where they tell you it's good for you to conserve energy and good for you to uh, you know, turn off those lights when you don't need and so on and so forth. But that is a behavioral change. So energy companies work a lot with psychologists to figure out which program would work the best so that people will buy into a demand response program. So there is a lot of opportunity in the energy system, and all of you could play, in, play a role to make those systems better, reliable, and efficient, and pollution-free. Thanks very much. Good luck.